Good morning, church. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Seo Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service this morning. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to gather together and worship together. So as we have embarked on a new journey of this season, we have been exploring scripture, ex ex uh, reflecting on the scripture like uh, the question, who am I? So um, our prayer is uh, during today's worship service, you will experience a profound connection with God and uncover your identity in Christ. So before diving into worship service, we have several announcements today. So first of all, I want to um, make sure that we are also very welcoming everyone who are joining in our worship service through Facebook Live. And if you are new here and newish here, we really want to connect with you and we really want to share our church life with you. So if you don't mind, please um, take a moment to fill out a connect card in the seat pocket in front of you. And also if you have been here but have any updates like new email address, phone number, physical address, please kindly update your information by filling out a connect card as well. And also we have another opportunity for being part of our church, which is new member class. So this Saturday on February 3rd, we have a new member class. So whether you are interested in joining our church or feel ready to join in our church, you are welcome to attend this gathering. So you can sign up on the new member bulletin board on the hallway or reach out to our director of communication, Christine Selby. And this Thursday, February 1st, we have start not shaken social event, which is a social gathering for those who are in their age of 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, we need our SVP, so and you can find the email address to our SVP in the bulletin insert, and that deadline is tomorrow. And also same day, February 1st, Thursday, Vacation Bible School registration open. So this year, VBS will be June from 17th through 20th. So please look for the link in the Children of Joy eBlast or on our social media pages like Facebook or Instagram. And the last one is uh, not this Tuesday, next Tuesday. So February 6th, we have STARS Valentine Luncheon. Um, the STARS is senior talking and Remembering the seasons. Yeah, so um, if you want to join this gathering, um, please sign up on the bulletin board in the hallway or reach out to our Director of Congregational Care, Nikki Perry. These are all things that I want to share right now. You can find more churches information in our insert. So now, beloved Riceville, let us prepare our hearts and minds before a guide. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord.
I come with joy to meet my Lord, forgiven, loved, and free, in awe and wonder to recall his life laid down for me, his life laid down for me. Please join me in our opening congregational prayer in the blue team. Creator God, you hear our worldliest hopes, hold our greatest fears, and know our deepest shame. Nothing we say, do, or think surprises you because you made us and know us more intimately than we know ourselves. As we seek to understand ourselves, give us courage, knowing that your love for us will never be called into question. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, our opening hymn is God of Grace and God of Glory, the number 577 in our hymnal. Please stand as you are able in your body or spirit. Before taking a seat, let us greet each other with a sign of peace saying, Peace be with you.
Now, I want to invite Graham Hergen Rader to read Psalm 4 January. Hi, I'm going to be reading Psalm 139, 13 through 18 today. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes behold my unformed substance, and your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them yet has existed. How mighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them, they are more than the sand. I come to the end, I am still with you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. I want Jesus to walk with me. Thank you, Kelly and Julia. Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and it is my honor and privilege to lead us in prayer this morning. So let us bow our heads. Dear God, you have bound us together in this life. Give us grace to understand how our lives depend on the courage, the industry, the honesty, and the integrity of those with whom we interact. May we be mindful of others' needs, including those that have been tasked to work with us and help us at school, home, store, the restaurant, even here at church. Help us to see the good in every task and every person we encounter. May our actions today bring glory to you and benefit to others. Help us to prioritize our tasks and give us the discipline to complete them. Let us be truly productive and not just busy. 
bless our efforts and let them bear fruit. Where there are challenges, give us the strength to face them head on and the resilience to bounce back from any setbacks. May we be steadfast and courageous, always aiming to do our best. And help us to remember that every challenge is an opportunity for growth. Globally, we ask for peace in the Middle East, especially between the warring parties in Israel and Gaza. And personally, for those who we know that are suffering from challenges and setbacks right now, we ask that you will lift them up with hope and healing as we name them out loud or in our hearts. Dear God, as we embark on this week's journey, help us to maintain a balanced approach to our tasks and responsibilities. Let us work diligently, but also grant us moments of rest and peace. We ask these things so we can be our best for you and for those around us as we try to follow in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's now the time of the service where we have the opportunity to give back to God a portion of what God has given to us. And so as the ushers come forward to uh, bring the offering plates uh, for us to collect today's offering, I also want to um, give you the opportunity um, to use a credit card or a debit card if you would prefer. There is a QR code on the uh, insert in the bulletin. There's a white insert um, that you can use instead of using the plates if you prefer. But I also want us to take a moment um, today to think about ways uh, not only that we can give financially, but ways that we might be able to give an offering of our time and our talents as the <coughs> ushers come forward.
Thank you, Julia. Now it's time for the children's sermon, so I invite all of the kids who are here to meet me down front for the children's time. Well, hello, everybody. Hey, that was great to hear from y'all. You, everybody doing well today? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm Pastor Doug, and uh, most Sundays I uh, get to speak to all the adults, but I, I, I negotiated a change today with Pastor Julia and Pastor Insu so that I could talk to you all. And so it's great to be able to be with you all today. Um, and I wanted to uh, begin by showing you something. I don't know that the adults can see it, but hopefully you can. Uh, anybody know what this is? What is it? It's an, animal. an animal puzzle. It's an animal puzzle um, with different animals on it. And, um, and so I was wondering if you all could help me put this back together if I took the pieces out. Now, I don't have a piece for everybody, but... Um, you know, perhaps a few of you that are up close could uh, help me put this back together again if I took it out. You think you could? Okay, all right, we're going to give it a shot. All right, here we go. I take, took the pieces out. All right, everybody jump up here, grab a piece. Everybody get one piece. There you go, and let's see if you can put it back in. Okay, can you put it in? There's the lion, there's the crocodile, the giraffe, the ostrich, the elephant, the hippopotamus, the zebra... And the rhinoceros, yes. Good job, well done. Excellent, excellent work. Um, well, I wanted you to notice something about the work that you just did. For us, we consider this puzzle a toy, don't we? But for somebody, this was work. Somebody created this puzzle. They made it. In fact, it says down here at the bottom... It was crafted by hand. That means somebody made each of these different animal pieces, and they carved them out of wood, and they painted them, and they painted the backdrop and painted the place where it needs to go, right? And they made this board, and for somebody, this was their work. Now, it was play for us, but it's work for somebody else. And I, I wanted you to think about that, and I hope that whoever made this feels a lot of joy and satisfaction for making this puzzle. I hear people all the time complain about their work, and they talk about, oh, work was so hard today. And it probably was. Work sometimes is very, very hard. But I hope that people who are at work will find joy and satisfaction in their job, just like I hope whoever made this feels good about knowing that they created a puzzle that taught us our animals and helped us to have fun and helped us understand shapes and to see neat colors. Um, I hope that they felt really good about the work that they did. And I hope that you will feel good about the work that you do, whether that work is called play or studying um, whatever it is that you do in a day. Um, and I hope that for everybody, for the big people out here too, if they're teachers, if they are construction workers, if they are moms and dads who are working hard to raise you up, or grandparents, they do work too, you know. Um, we all do work of some kind, and I want us all to feel a deep, joy that comes from that work because it allows each of us the opportunity to contribute to the world around us, to the community around us, to our families, to all kinds of people by participating in good work. And so, um, so that's what I want us to think about today is that um, everybody has an opportunity, even at your age, to do good work for the benefit of everybody else, okay? Let's pray about that. Repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God 
Thank you for this day. Thank you for me. Thank you for my skills, my talents, my fun time, my rest time, my study time, and my work time. May it bring me joy and others as well. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody have a great week. We'll see you. Good morning. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy and privilege to get to bring you our scripture and message today. If you'd like, you can pull out this green insert that's in your bulletin and read along. We are in Genesis chapter 2, where we've been in Genesis, the first two chapters, for several weeks in a row, and um, I know that I'm really enjoying the chance to really read this closely and deeply to understand it better. So our passage today is Genesis 2, verses 1 through 9, and also verse 15. Hear now this word. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. On the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no vegetation of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, Eden to kill to till it and keep it. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me now? Holy and loving God, we, your people, are longing today to hear a word from you. God, I ask that in this time you would use even me to speak to your people. Lord, if there's anything that I say that isn't from you, let it be instantly forgotten. But God, anything that I say that is from you, let it sink and root deeply into our hearts. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Airplanes are particularly tricky places for pastors. Now, I'm not saying this because pastors are afraid of flying universally or anything like that, but it's because of what happens the moment that you sit down next to someone. You all know this. You sit down, you get everything all arranged, and then the person next to you turns to you, and what do they say? What do you do? Well, every pastor that I know has a different strategy to deal with this. It's not that we're embarrassed that we're pastors, but rather, depending on how the next moment goes, how this person responds to the fact that you're a pastor, you could possibly be in a situation where the next two and a half hours are going to be really uncomfortable. Sometimes uh, people will intentionally lean into this and, you know, have a Bible out and are hoping for someone to ask them so that they could possibly start a meaningful conversation about faith. Others um, try to use sort of clever half-truths to get around it. What do you do? 
oh, I work for an international nonprofit. <laughs> and then there's people who just try to avoid this altogether. I'll always remember the first time that I was on a plane with the dean of my college, who was also a lifelong Baptist preacher. And his strategy was that as soon as he sat down, he put in his headphones and focused diligently on Candy Crush. <laughs> However pastors come up with to deal with this struggle, we all know that we, everyone loves to ask this question, what do you do? Why is it that this is a question that feels so central to getting to know someone, that we ask it almost immediately? Well, we're in the midst right now of a sermon series called Who Am I? Where we're studying Genesis to try to understand how we were created and what that means for how we ought to live our lives. And work, maybe surprisingly, is central to that creation. Work has a difficult relationship with us in our culture. And I think that part of that is because we have several myths that we've learned about what work is that isn't truly what God had in mind. So today we're going to talk through several of these myths and then also ask what the truth of scripture reveals to us about reality. The first myth is this, that work is a necessary evil. In other words, we work because we need to survive, right? Someone needs to put food on the table. And if we didn't need to work, then we wouldn't. But the reality that's grounded in scripture is that work is good. The first instance of the word that's translated as work in the Bible, you have this on your scripture sheet, it's melaka, is found in Genesis 2.2 which says, on the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. God is the first worker. And the first work that is done is the work of creation. And over and over again, God says that this work is good. If God is a worker, and we are made in the image of God, then our work is one way that we show the image of God to the world. In addition to this, work for humans specifically was designed before the fall. Work is not a consequence of living in a fallen world. Now, I have to tell you that originally when I was working on this sermon, I had plan to make some sort of point about the fact that God doesn't need us to work, right? That God has a purpose for our work, but that, of course, God could manage this without us. But as I started reading the text more carefully and really digging into it, I found something that started to challenge my thinking on this. Genesis 2.5 describes a moment when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no vegetation of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. Now, this phrase, there was no one to till the ground, is really interesting. The word that has been translated here very generally as no one is actually in Hebrew, no adam. You see, before Adam is a name, it's a descriptive word that means something like human being. And it comes from the word Adama, which means earth. The Adam is the one who comes from the Adama. So more accurately, this phrase could be translated as there was no earthling to till the earth. The earth, as God designed it, can't flourish without an earthling to till it. It's less about what is possible and more about what is fitting. Of course, God could sustain the earth without humans, but in God's imagination, it is right for humans to be involved. 
Our flourishing is bound up together, and the very grammar of the passage makes this clear. We see the same vision for humanity all over the pages of scripture. We have been called to be co-creators with God. The grace of creation isn't just that we exist and even more that we are loved by God, but that God actually wants us to participate in creating the world as he has imagined it to be. When we are actively engaged in helping to bring this world about using the skills that have been given to us, we are imaging God in the world. Our work becomes a participation in God's work, and God is glorified. So the first myth is that work is a necessary evil. But the truth is that work is good. The second myth is that work is what you're paid for. I bet that there's some of you here who think that you are not a worker. Maybe you are still a student, and so you don't have a job. Or maybe you think that work is what you used to do before you retired. Or work is what you used to do before you started staying home and caring for your children full time. We have these ideas because our culture has always tied work primarily to compensation. Work is what you get paid to do. And the quality and importance of your work can be understood by how much someone else is willing to pay you to do your work. But God's definition of work is not tied to compensation. Remember, the first reference to work in scripture is to God's work. And God never received a paycheck. And then God gives a job to humans to till the earth in the Garden of Eden. And they also don't get paid for this work. But if work isn't the thing that you get paid to do, then what is it? We get two clues about the definition of work here in the text of Genesis 2. First, God's work is defined by God's satisfaction with it. God finds the work of creating the world to be fulfilling. At every phase in the creation process, God stops and says, this is good. For God, the work of creation has inherent value. It is worth doing. Have you ever had that feeling of completing a task or finishing a project or creating something and sitting back for a moment and thinking, this is good. It's likely that that thing is your work. Work is the thing that you do because it is worth doing. Our second clue about the definition of work comes from the charge given to humans. Genesis 2.15 says that God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. This word till is translated from the Hebrew word avad. You also have that in your sermon notes. And avad is translated as to till several times in the Old Testament. But drastically more often, avad is translated as to serve. Rightly, work is service. Our work is what we do to serve the community around us. Work is not defined by compensation, but by contribution. Our third myth is that only some work matters. I hope that I've convinced you by this point that you do have work, but I bet that some of you still don't think that your work really matters all that much, or at least that 
your work doesn't have anything really to do with God. I believe that this is the most dangerous myth about work that we have. If you hear nothing else that I say in this sermon, please hear this. Your work is no less holy than mine. Your work is no less holy than mine. I was recently listening to a podcast about faith and the workplace. And one of the hosts, who's a pastor, was telling a story about a man in his congregation who was a very successful builder. In fact, he had done such excellent work, both through the craft of building and as a businessman, that he had grown his company to the point where you really couldn't drive down a street in their town without seeing something that that company had built. And his work was known to be very high quality, right? So the buildings would stand for a long time and to also be beautiful. Well, this man was talking with his pastor and he said, you know, God has given me this ability to have all of this business success so that I can make money and give it to the church so that people like you can do the real work of the kingdom. Now, of course, the pastor was incredibly grateful that this man understood part of his role as to be to provide financially for the needs of the church. But he was also heartbroken that this man didn't see any other value to the work that he had done. You see, the pastor could see that there was inherent value to the work that this man had done that there were people living in strong, safe, beautiful places, that others had a place to have shelter for their work. This had value on its own. As pastors, our job is to equip you to live as disciples wherever it is that you are. The mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And let me tell you, the transformation of the world isn't going to come from more people sitting in pews. The transformation of the world is going to happen when there are passionate Jesus followers following Jesus in whatever ordinary corner of the world they live their lives. One of my favorite thought leaders in this area is Dorothy Sayers. You may know Dorothy Sayers as a English writer who was active in the first half of the 20th century. She wrote mystery novels, plays, poetry, and all sorts of essays. She was also a very committed Christian, and she was passionate on this topic of faith and work. In one essay, she wrote this. Let the church remember this that every maker and worker is called to serve God in his profession or trade, not outside of it. The apostles complained rightly when they said it was not meant they should leave the word of God and serve tables. Their vocation was to preach the word. But the person whose vocation it is to prepare the meals beautifully might with equal justice protest it is not meant for us to leave the service of our tables to preach the word. The official church wastes time and energy and moreover commits sacrilege in demanding that secular workers should neglect their proper vocation in order to do Christian work, by which she means ecclesial work. The only Christian work is good work well done. Let the church see to it that the workers are Christian people and do their work well as to God. Then all the work will be Christian work, whether it is church embroidery or sewage farming. Good work, well done. That is the definition of Christian work. God is calling you to do your work, whatever that is, well, because when good work is well done, 
God is glorified, period. Part of the time that I was working on this sermon, I was sitting in a coffee shop. And because I was writing this, I was paying a special attention to the two baristas who were behind uh, the counter. There were these two young women, and they seemed to really enjoy their work. I was amazed that every time someone walked in the door, they knew them. They could say their name. They could ask about things that were happening in their life, even their pets. And when someone like myself walked in who'd never been there before, they were still equally welcoming. In fact, one of the girls behind the counter spent a long time talking with me about all of the different drinks on the menu and making a recommendation to me based on what I told her I liked. Then the other woman started getting to work making my cold brew lavender latte with oat milk. And she moved around the espresso machines like a dancer, pulling levers and turning switches and finally pouring this delicious liquid into a mug for me. And as she slid that drink across the bar to me, I thought, this is beautiful. God is using the talents and skills of these two young women to make this incredible drink for me. This is good work, well done. And then on Thursday morning, I was leading a Bible study that we have here for young women in the church. And there was a young woman who was there and was reading her Bible while also holding her baby. She somehow managed to be holding a Bible, two different pieces of paper, a pencil, and feeding her baby all at the same time. And let me tell you, as I've tried to put words to this, I am more and more baffled because I literally have no idea how she did that with only two arms. But she was able to respond to what was to me imperceptible needs of her daughter, all while also holding a Bible. And as I looked at her, I thought, This is beautiful. This is good work. Well done. And then on Friday, my husband and I had our first call of the year with our tax accountant to get ready to start filing our taxes. Let me tell you, taxes are something I do not understand at all. All of the different rules, it completely goes over my head. And so I was really stressed out going into this call. But our accountant really put me at ease. It was clear he completely understood this forward and backwards, and he was able to give us advice and answer my questions in a way that made sense to me. And I was so grateful that there's people out there like him who have this skill set that I certainly do not have. And I'm so grateful that he's using those skills to serve the world. And I thought, this is beautiful. This is good work. Well done. When you do your good work well, you glorify God. I want to invite you to a practice this week. Typically here in church, after we receive our offerings on those lovely gold offering plates, One of the pastors will receive it from the ushers, turn around, and hold it up to the cross and the altar as an offering to God. We understand this to be an act of praise and worship, taking our finite contributions and entrusting them to God, believing that somehow they will be multiplied to do more than they could do on their own. I want you to imagine this week when you come to the end of the day, that you take all of the work that you've done in that day, place it in one of those offering plates, and hold it up to God as an offering. There will still be unfinished to-do list items on your task list. There will likely still be problems that aren't yet resolved. But when we offer our work to God, we do so trusting that our finite contribution 
will be multiplied and perfected by an infinite God. Good work. Well done. That's all any of us can hope to offer. And in the hands of our God, it is enough. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, I thank you for each and every person in this room. God, I thank you for the ways that you have gifted them and blessed them for specific work. Lord, I pray today that they would take authority to do that work well and to your glory. Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't feel that their contribution matters, God, I ask that you would speak to them and convict them of the truth that they have a critical role to play. Lord, we thank you that you are calling us to participate with you in creating the world. Lord, we thank you that you want us to do this work with you. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to stand and join together in our closing hymn, number 399. service, I accidentally introduced that as our opening hymn, which I felt very embarrassed by at first. But then as I started thinking about it, I thought, you know what? That kind of is our opening hymn. It's the closing hymn for worship, but it's the opening hymn for your work, for you to go out into the world and be a disciple of Jesus Christ wherever you spend your time. So go now from this place to do your good work well done. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day 
that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. Amen. 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 Amen.